Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today's question is this month's patron pick. By the way, thank you so much to all of my supporters on Patreon. I really appreciate all of you so much. The topic that was selected for this month is how does mutate work? And I'll confess, basically I had no idea what the answer to this question was myself before about a month ago. This mechanic had come out during the COVID and I was silently hoping that it would just never have any questions come up. One thing I do like about these patron pick episodes is that they force me to go a little bit outside my comfort zone and handle topics that I might not have ordinarily touched. So let's start at the very beginning. If you have a card with Mutate, then you can just cast it normally for its normal mana cost. If you do that, it's just like casting any other creature spell. You also have another option though. You can cast it for its Mutate cost, which will result in a mutating creature spell. What does that mean? Well, unlike a normal creature spell, a mutating creature spell has a target. It targets a non-human creature that has to be owned by the same person that is the owner of the spell. Now, that's right. The target cannot be a human. I'm not really sure why humans can't mutate in magic. This bothers me as a player because it doesn't really make any sense. I mean, if humans can't mutate, how do you explain Spider-Man or the X-Men or... Okay, so on the other hand, as a judge, it bothers me because it's completely arbitrary. There's probably a lot of people who have unintentionally broken the rules by trying to mutate onto a human because why wouldn't you be able to do that? Actually, there's another reason why I don't like this situation and it's from a kind of an artistic point of view. Human is the only creature type that has associated rules baggage. Ever since they got rid of Legends and gave all the walls Defender because they recognized that having creature types with rules baggage wasn't a great idea back in Kamigawa block. But I guess that's not the first time they went back on something that they decided in Kamigawa block. So anyway, you have to target a non-human creature that you control. We'll get to what happens if the target becomes illegal in a little bit, but first I wanted to point out that casting a spell using its mutate ability counts just as much as casting a spell as casting it normally would. So if there's any additional costs, you still have to pay those. If there's anything saying you can't play a creature spell, then you can't cast a mutating creature spell, etc. Another important consequence of this is that you have the option of casting using mutate anytime when you're casting a spell, even if you aren't casting it from your hand. So if you were using a future site to cast it, or if you exiled it with expressive iteration, you would still be able to cast a card with mutate as a normal creature or as a mutating creature spell. It's your choice. There is one important caveat to this though. If you noticed, you have to pay the spell's mutate cost in order to play it as a mutating creature spell. If you don't pay this cost, then you're not playing it that way. You're playing it as a normal creature spell. This is significant because we have this rule here that says you can only pay one alternative cost to cast a spell. There's no way to combine them, I agree, however thematic that might be, but unfortunately that's not how it works. Also, without paying its mana cost counts as paying an alternative cost. So if you hit a mutate card with Cascade, you would be able to cast it only as a normal creature spell. Okay, so let's say that you've cast a mutating creature spell. Now let's talk about what happens when it resolves. Or maybe it doesn't resolve, that's a thing that can happen too after all. Just like any other targeted spell, it checks to see if its targets are still legal before it can resolve. This target could become illegal in any number of ways. Maybe it left the battlefield, maybe it isn't a creature anymore, or maybe it's a human now. Whatever the reason, the target isn't legal anymore. If that happens, then the spell ceases to be a mutating creature spell and just turns into a normal everyday creature spell. Everything will proceed as if you had cast it as a normal creature spell in the first place. On the other hand, let's say that the target is still legal. And in that case, the mutating creature spell's resolution will result in it merging with the targeted creature. The spell's controller will put it either on top or on bottom of the targeted creature, and the resulting mutated permanent has all the characteristics of whatever is on top, and it has the exception, which is that it has all the abilities of its other constituents. Another exception is that if any of those constituents happen to be a commander, then the entire permanent is considered to be a commander and its damage is treated accordingly. Going onto the battlefield this way doesn't actually count as a permanent entering the battlefield. Even though there's another physical piece of cardboard on your playmat in front of you, as far as the game is concerned, a creature has not entered the battlefield and you still control the exact same number of permanents and so on. It's just that one of those permanents has some different characteristics. Abilities that trigger when something enters the battlefield will not trigger, but abilities that trigger when a creature mutates will. A consequence of this is that if the creature that you merged onto was in play at the start of the turn, then you can attack with that creature, even if you put the mutate card on top. So now let's talk about what happens once the mutate card is on the battlefield. Well, I already mentioned that its characteristics are just the same as whatever is on top is, except it has all the abilities of any of the components. 
It's also considered to be the same permanent that it was when it was targeted. So any counters that were on that creature would stay and any continuous effects that were acting on it would remain. But there's a couple of other interesting things to know. First, merging with a creature changes its characteristics and it does so in the copy layer. So these characteristics that are changed can be copied by other permanents. So if you clone a mutated creature, then the clone will have the characteristics of whatever is on top with the abilities of everything else in the permanent. In other words, it will look just exactly like what would happen if you took another copy of the creature that you cloned. Another thing is kind of interesting is that the clone will not update its characteristics to match even if you merge some more creatures onto this thing that you copied. So that is pretty much the same as what you would see if you change the characteristics of something that you copied with the clone normally. Another interesting thing to note is that it is possible to merge with something that isn't a creature normally. So let's say you animated a vehicle, you could cast a mutating creature spell and merge with that. Later on, the effect that's making the vehicle into an artifact creature would wear off, and if the vehicle was on top, it would stop being a creature at that point. It would still have all the abilities of the stuff that you merged onto it, though. On the other hand, if the thing on top of the merged vehicle permanent is a creature, then that permanent will still be a creature after the turn ends. It probably won't be an artifact, but if you wanted to, you could make it one, uh, because you could activate the vehicle's crew ability, which that permanent would still have, and that would make it an artifact creature again. Tokens are another weird case. A mutated permanent is considered to be a token if the top part is a token. Otherwise, it's a normal creature. The tokenness of the rest of the components doesn't factor into the equation at all. So if you mutated something onto a 1-1 soldier token, then it will either be immune to Ether Snap or it will be best friends with Inara Tandris, according to whether you had the token go on top or bottom. What about double-faced cards? Well, a merged permanent is never considered to be a double-faced card, even if it contains one or more double-faced components. If something instructs you to transform a merged permanent, all of the constituent double-faced parts of it will transform, not just the top one. So you could be in for a bunch of new abilities. On the other hand, remember, it is not possible for a modal double-faced card to transform. Only transforming double-faced cards will change from uh, front face to back face or vice versa. I suppose now might be a good time for me to mention that the only time the game cares about whether any component of a prospective merged permanent is a human is when the mutating creature spells targets or being evaluated for legality. Once merged together, the game doesn't care anymore if one or more of the components of a merged permanent gain the human subtype. That won't cause the permanent to demerge or anything like that. Finally, if any of the components of a face-up merged permanent are double face cards, then that permanent cannot be turned face down. And by the way, that's face down as in the thing that the morph mechanic uses. Uh, that's what I'm referring to. I'm not referring to a uh, transforming card being put on the other face up. It's kind of confusing, I know, but you know that's how magic works, I suppose. Uh, speaking of morph, a merged permanent's face up or face down status is solely determined by the topmost component. So that means that you could cast a mutate creature spell on a face down creature and put it on top. Unfortunately, this does not count as turning that creature face up, even though it did in fact go from being face down to being face up over the course of that play. If a merged permanent is turned face up or face down, each of its components is turned face up or face down as appropriate. And hey, anybody remember these? So if a merged permanent contains a flip card, then the side that's active will be the set of characteristics that the game looks at. If it flips after the merge, then the new characteristics will be considered. Okay, finally, we need to talk about what would happen if one of these merged permanents leaves the battlefield. In such a case, the game treats this as one permanent leaving the battlefield and the appropriate number of cards being put into the appropriate zone. So a blood artist would trigger once, but a profane memento would trigger multiple times. If a merged permanent is put into your library, you can choose the order of the cards going into your library, and you don't have to tell your opponent what order you chose. You also get to choose the order if a merged permanent is going into your graveyard, which could come up if you merge some creatures with a nether shadow. If a player exiles a merged permanent, then that player chooses the order of the timestamps of the cards going to the exile zone. This is a little bit unusual because usually the owner would be the one to make that choice. This rule exists so that if Amy plays a duplicate against Nick's merged creature, then Amy will decide which creature her duplicate stats are based on. What about cards like Mimic Bat? Well, like we said before, that trigger is based on a creature leaving the battlefield, so it only triggers once. When that ability resolves, it will be able to find and exile all the components that make up the merge card that died because any actions that are taken on the card that died are taken on each of the cards that are found. 
So since all of the merged cards get exiled together, they all stay exiled. Of course, any of the cards that were already exiled previously will be returned to their owner's graveyards as normal. When you activate the Mimic app, you'll choose which of the exiled cards that you're going to make a copy of. Finally, there's the matter of replacement effects. Well, let's say there's a Rest in Peace out. I think it would be pretty uncontroversial to say that all the components of the merged permanent would be getting exiled instead of going to the graveyard. But what if we had both Rest in Peace and Wheel of Sun and Moon? Could you send some components to your library and others to exile? Unfortunately, no. Applying a replacement effect will apply to all of the components, so you could put them all in exile or all on bottom of your library, but you could not mix and match. Commanders have a special exception that ensures you can always put it into the command zone, so if you had a Wheel of Sun and Moon and your commander was part of a merge permanent, you could have your commander go to the command zone and the rest go to the bottom of your library. This would not happen with the Rest in Peace example because the thing that lets you put your commander from exile into the command zone actually isn't a replacement effect anymore. I made a video where I talked about this a while back, and I recommend you check that out if you're interested in some more detail. Actually, there is one more exception to talk about besides that commander one. Maybe you noticed that Rest in Peace puts cards and tokens into the exile zone, whereas Wheel of Sun and Moon only applies to cards. So I think it should be pretty okay to say that Rest in Peace, everything is getting exiled, even if there's some tokens among the components of the merged permanent. But what about with Wheel and Sun and Moon? especially considering what we said earlier about how emerged permanence tokenness is determined solely based on the top component, that's a really interesting question. So the way that it actually works is this. If a merged permanent is destroyed while its controller is affected by Wheel of Sun and Moon, then if the top component is a non-token, then the entire merged permanent is treated as a non-token, and that means that every component is put on the bottom of your library, even if some of them are tokens. Like always, these tokens will cease to exist the next time state-based actions are checked. On the other hand, if the top component is a token, then all of the token components are put into your graveyard, and the merged creature is considered to have died. All of the card components are put on the bottom of the library, though. Wow, that is a lot to take in, but I think we still have time for one last challenge question. I couldn't really sleep with myself if I teased this one in the thumbnail, but I never talked about it. So, okay, how does Chef's Kiss work with Mutate? So let's say that Nick played this Chef's Kiss spell against Amy's Dreamtail Heron. Then he would gain control of Dreamtail Heron. Then he would copy it. And now we would have to randomly reselect targets for both spells. For the copied Heron, that's going to be a problem because Nick owns that copy, so it would need to target a creature that he owns, but Chef's Kiss says it can't target a creature that he controls. There probably isn't a creature in play that satisfies both of those criteria, and given that's the case, then that spell's target will remain unchanged because it's impossible to change it. When the copy tries to resolve, the game will find the target is illegal, and a copy of Dreamtail Heron will enter the battlefield under Nick's control. For the original Heron, it also needs to target a creature that Nick doesn't control, but even though Nick controls this spell now, Amy still owns it. So the new target could be any of Amy's non-human creatures, chosen at random from among all the legal alternatives. The spell will resolve and merge with that creature, but Nick, as the controller of the spell, will make the decisions about what happens when it resolves, including whether the Heron goes on top or on bottom. Pretty cool, right? And with that, I think you should know enough about Mutate to answer any question that's likely to come up, and most of the ones that are unlikely to come up for that matter. If you have any others that I didn't get to, definitely ask in the comments, and I'll try to do my best to get to all of them. Thanks once again to all of my patrons, as well as to anybody who supports this channel in any way, including subscribing, commenting, recommending it to friends, or suggesting topics for future episodes. But that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Join me again next time for another daily ruling, but until then, I hope you have a great day.